Hi all, thank you for your patience. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, we are set up now, so hopefully you can hear us well. Um, but welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm your host, Jessica King, and I just wanted to thank you quickly for joining us today. This webinar is for all of our ladies listening and wanting to put their health first today. Um, today we'll have one of our OBGYN physicians, Dr. Kathy Sander, go over the different times in a woman's life she should be seeing her doctor and at what ages. Uh, here's a little more info on today's speaker. Dr. Sander is board certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Her clinical interests include general and high-risk obstetrics, treatment of menstrual problems, preconceptual counseling, contraceptive uh, options, including, these are hard names, Nexplanon, Nexplanon. Nexplanon. Okay. <laughs> uh, IUDs, Esher, NuvaRing, oral contraceptives, and sterilization surgery, treatment of menopausal concerns. She also has experience in non-invasive surgery, including laparoscopy, thank you, and robotic surgery. She joined Kelsey Siebold in August of 2001, which means that this August you will hit your 16-year anniversary with Kelsey Siebold. That's amazing. Congratulations. And she practices at the Women's Center. Don't forget that we'll be taking any questions you may have. Um, at the end of the presentation. If a question happens to pop up, just type it into your question box and we will do our best to address it after Dr. Sanders' presentation. And now I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Okay. Hi everybody. <clears throat> um, today I'm going to be talking about just general women's health and we'll start, start talking just about different stages that women go through. Um, as a woman ages, they obviously go through different reproductive stages in their lives. These include prepubescence, puberty, reproductive years, perimenopause, sometimes you'll hear that called premenopause, and menopause. And men, women obviously see their OBGYN GYN throughout their lifetime and each deve developmental change comes with different health concerns. So ages 12 through 15. I do see patients that are this age. Um, it might seem young, and um, it is, but it's a great time to have a first visit with me as an OBGYN. Um, the visit is really an external exam only. We don't do many pelvic exams on patients that are this age for obvious reasons. It's that it could be scary, and we don't want this visit to be scary for girls. This is a chance for a young woman to establish care with a doctor once she's really outgrown her pediatrician. Um, most of these visits involve discussion of normal function of the body, menstrual cycles. We talk about protection from sexually transmitted diseases um, because it's important for girls to know how to protect themselves. We often talk about a Gardasil vaccination for HPV because it's a great age to be vaccinated prior to exposure um, to all STDs, but especially HPV, which is so prominent. And also we talk about um, contraception. We talk about contraception for problem visits for girls this age also, because sometimes the use of contraception can be used to actually help young women manage really difficult menstrual cycles. I always tell patients that it's unfortunate sometimes that the treatment for difficult, heavy, for example, menstrual cycles is in the form of contraception, meaning that I'm sorry that the pills are called that. Um, we'd rather not call them birth control pills sometimes. Oops, sorry about that. And that's okay. There you go. Moving on so, to age 21. So I'm actually going to talk not just about age 21, but age 21 in further years. But So at age 21, it's kind of a landmark year um, in that we recommend at that age that you get your first pap smear. We actually do not recommend pap smears before age 21. The logic there is a difficult one to describe. It's thought that there's so commonly exposure to HPV before age 21 that if we screen women too young, they will almost all have abnormal pap smears and perhaps be exposed to unnecessary procedures because of those abnormal pap smears. That's really the basis by which we established age 21 or the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology established that age for the first recommended pap smear. 
after age 21, when we do the first pap, it's recommended that pap smears and visits be annual. Obviously, I see patients more than annually for problems, but routinely, an annual visit for um, a full exam is recommended. At this age, we also emphasize breast exams, but I will tell you that even with my younger women, um, we talk about breast exams so they can get in the habit of doing them. I tell patients that the best timing for a breast exam is after a menstrual cycle, so it can be done monthly, and it can be done at a time when breasts are less likely to have hormonal sensitivity and maybe show lumps and bumps that wouldn't be there if they wait till their menstrual flow has started or has stopped. Um, we also talk at age 21 on about reproductive choices, um, family planning, um, and contraception. Um, I want to bring this up also that as patients get closer to the age of 30s and 32 to even 35, sometimes we even talk about things like planning on egg freezing, which is an interesting conversation for women that want to consider not um, rushing their family planning, where they prefer to take their time with whether it be um, planning their career or perhaps they're marrying um, in their 30s and want to have an opportunity to get to know their spouse before making children with that person. So we talk about that option also. Age 40. <clears throat> this is really the recommended age for the first mammogram. Um, we do offer mammograms sooner than that and counsel about the need for mammograms sooner than age 40 based on family history. Um, it used to be that we recommended a mammogram at age 35, um, and that was really for the purposes of comparison, meaning we got a baseline mammogram at 35 to then compare to mammograms at age 40. Um, getting a mammogram earlier than age 40 again has some risks for false positive findings because the younger you are when you're getting a mammogram, the denser your breasts are and so the more likely you are to have findings that really are not significant and you it may develop anxiety about the need for follow-up ultrasound or even the possibility of a follow-up biopsy. Um, mammograms at age 40 though are recommended. Um, this is according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Women ask me a lot about my thoughts about annual mammogram because other colleges recommend less frequent mammogram. I tell women that based on the lifetime risk of breast cancer being a relatively high one for cancer, that having an annual mammogram is a great idea. It really um, screens for a cancer that's common. So ages 40 to 45, <clears throat> women typically hit symptoms of pre- or perimenopause at this time. Some women actually have symptoms of perimenopause earlier than their 40s, <clears throat> sometimes even as early as mid-30s. Um, during perimenopause, your hormonal rhythms change, and that causes irregular cycles. The, the mechanism by which this happens is that you don't have the reliability of ovulating or forming an egg that's available for fertilization re, um, reliably every month. And consequent to that, you have an irregular cycle. The most common symptoms that we're, I'm discussing that lead up to menopause are changes in one's menstrual cycle, also hot flashes, moodiness, vaginal dryness, and night sweats. So in your 50s, 51 is the typical age that women begin menopause. <clears throat> it's actually considered 51 and a half if you want to be specific. Um, and by definition, menopause is defined as stopping one's monthly cycle, not bleeding, um, with their menstruation for at least one year. Um, some women, as I said before, can really start going through menopause and stopping their period as early as age 40. Um, and some really can continue having periods as late as age 60. It varies. So in menopause, what should you expect? Um, menstrual changes, as we discussed. Hot flashes. Sometimes more 
prominent than hot flashes are the sensation of cold that one gets after having a hot flash, especially at nighttime. Women commonly say, <clears throat> I don't wake up hot as much as I wake up freezing cold. And that's common in Houston because when you have a hot flash, it's followed by the air conditioning that you usually have on you at night and you're sweaty and the air conditioning hits you and you feel freezing cold. So women are commonly throwing the sheets off and then putting the sheets back on. Menopause, also with menopause you should expect, not everybody, but a lot of patients have sleep disturbances or sleep problems. You also can have some sexual changes. Um, those vary. Um, it could be a decrease in libido, meaning an interest in having sex. It also can include vaginal dryness, as I stated before. Bone changes are also common in menopause. Um, you can have cardiovascular disease. Um, it's really at the age of menopause that the rates of cardiovascular diseases for women start catching up to men. Um, emotional changes are also super common with this stage of life. So menstrual changes. As discussed earlier, um, perimenopause can occur in your 40s when hormonal levels change and your cycle then becomes irregular. Um, Menstrual changes, as I said, are normal during this time. Um, that can involve skipping periods. That can involve having more frequent periods. Um, and all of this is because your ovaries are producing less estrogen because you're not having regular ovulation. The number of days between periods can increase, decrease. As I said, periods can become, the duration of bleeding can become shorter or longer, the amount of bleeding can become heavier or lighter. It really varies, and a lot of women will say it's not fair that some women transition and have really very minimal symptoms with perimenopause and menopause where they just stopped having their period. And then for every person like that, there's somebody that has hot flashes and irregular periods for really a period of years. I commonly make the analogy to women that perimenopause is much like puberty. It is not an overnight deal. It lasts for years, and it's really only after it's through that you can look back and say, oh, yeah, I was perimenopausal at that time. Okay, so hot flashes. Let me just say that if you've had a hot flash, you, you really know it. So if you're doubting, hmm, have I had a hot flash or not, you probably haven't really had a hot flash. People commonly say to me, well, it's hot in Houston. Am I having hot flashes? And I tell them, no, you will know a hot flash when it happens to you. It's a sudden feeling of heat that really rushes to the upper part of your body and face. Um, and it really is very uncomfortable and a very common symptom. It can last a few seconds. It can last even several minutes. The frequency that you have hot flashes and the number of years um, that you have hot flashes for really varies for every woman. Some women hot flash more commonly at night. Some women hot flash more commonly during the day. And depending on when they're describing their hot flashes, they describe different symptoms. When I referenced before the complaint of feeling very cold, those are women that are having hot flashes really commonly at night where they're going to bed. Classically, the onset of early perimenopausal hot flashes are that they're two or three in the morning. You suddenly feel very warm. You kick off the covers. You push the dog away from you. You push the husband away from you. And you um, get the sheets off of you. And then in a matter of a few minutes, you're very cold because you're usually a little bit sweaty. And you cover back up quickly so that you don't feel too cold. So hot flashes, there are lots of tips that can help you cope. Let me first also say that there are lots of medical management for hot flashes. Those treatments can include hormones. And once you get to a place in menopause, hormones are available. Um, risks and benefits are discussed about hormonal use for each individual, but they are very successful at treating hot flashes. SSRIs, or serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or antidepressants, also are helpful to, con to curb the frequency of hot flashes. Um, there are herbal supplements. Um, commonly recommended is black 
cohosh is a common one that's found in over-the-counter um, herbal supplements or over-the-counter products that you can find at Walgreens that have these herbs in them. And they are beneficial to some women, but not all. There are even some blood pressure medications that can help curb hot flashes. Um, they're not as recommended just because they're not as capable of treating hot flashes as their recommendations. But things to cope. I mean, when you're going to bed, dress in light layers. Wear dry fit t-shirts instead of heavy cotton clothes. Breathable cotton is great, but even better are... Um, are dry fit pajamas and they sell them online. Um, use a fan. You, If you're having hot flashes and you don't have moving air in your room, then you're going to be sorry because you're much less likely going to be able to cool off quickly and also you're unlikely to um, really not, you could possibly even decrease the number of hot flashes that you have. And I want to explain that. It turns out that a hot flash is kind of reaching a threshold where you get to a point where you are, your body temperature is rising um, and then you're kind of thrown over the edge. If you're able to really kind of stop that progression, you're much less likely to have that hot flash. So if you feel like some a hot flash is coming on and you're able to drink something cold, quickly cool off, um, then you're less likely to experience a hot flash. It is true that women that have hot flashes that move to colder, drier climates are actually less likely to experience the frequency of hot flashes than women, frankly, that are living in Houston, Texas, where it's not only hot but very humid. Recently, studies have come out talking about the benefits of cardiovascular protection. It turns out that the better health you have cardiovascularly, the less likely you are to have severe hot flashes in this menopausal state of life. So exercising regularly for the benefits of cardiovascular disease also translate to the helpfulness with regard to hot flashes. If you are just entering a stage of life where you're starting to have hot flashes or go through that perimenopause transition to menopause, we recommend that you get busy and that you step it up with your exercise program. It turns out that there are some foods also. Spicy foods can increase the odds of hot flashes. Um, and probably more significantly is alcohol. Um, drinking alcohol at night, for some women, um, red wine is a particularly bad culprit. Some women will even say that balsamic vinaigrette on their salad, being obviously a relative of red wine, um, a red wine vinaigrette being, I guess, more specific, can increase the odds of hot flashes. Staying out of the heat, living in a cooler, drier climate is obviously beneficial. That's very difficult to do in our city. Um, using a fan, as I mentioned, sleeping in light clothing, avoid those big covers, um, talk to your, um, your partner so that he knows that you need not have all the covers and that you need the air conditioning to be set at 72, not 75. Um, you need the overhead fan going. Um, all of those things are helpful to decrease the number of hot flashes you have. Um, I tell patients that having a cold ice water bottle nearby that doesn't leak if you Drink it quickly in the middle of the night so you can try to keep yourself as sleepy as possible helps. Um, having a damp cold cloth is helpful. Um, they even make products that you can get on Amazon that are covers that have a fan built in to blow cold air underneath the cover. So there's lots of things that you can do to cope with hot flashes. Sleep problems. So normal sleep rhythms really are disrupted by perimenopausal changes, and this definitely can affect your mood. It definitely affects your health. Um, things that help sleep problems um, in perimenopause include staying on a schedule um, as much as you can, try to go to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time, um, eating regular meals at regular times and not having late uh, meals, especially not drinking alcohol late in the evening, um, or caffeine, for obvious reasons, um, late in the day. Caffeine actually stays in your bloodstream for up to six hours, and it can definitely be a classic reason that patients can't sleep at night. 
As I said, avoid nightcaps. Alcohol can make you feel drowsy, but it turns out that it doesn't help you stay asleep. Um, rec regular exercise is very beneficial. Some patients swear by exercise in the evening. Some feel that that's really um, contradictory for them, that they need to be morning exercisers, where they morning exercise that they can sleep at night because the exercise winds them up. All those tips that I discussed to help with hot flashes will help you sleep at night if the hot flashes are the reasons that you're getting up at night. And that is a very common reason for sleep disturbances. Um, sleep problems, I will just tell you, are very hard to fix. And that you will hear physicians like myself talking about non-medication ways to help with sleep problems like I've listed here and like I'm discussing with you because most sleep aids are habit forming and there really isn't an easy way to medicate yourself to sleep. Um, I tell patients to really consider meditation and yoga before they consider a sleep aid by mouth that they take by pill just because every sleep aid can be habit forming. So sexual changes, these are also really common at this stage of life with perimenopause and endomenopause. Um, as estrogen levels go down, the vaginal lining changes. It becomes thinner, it becomes drier, and more specifically, it becomes less elastic. Um, this is actually a more common complaint when a woman has been several years without a period. It's something that I talk to patients about to pay attention to um, so that they don't get to a place where they're having um, painful intercourse because the dryness can. It can cause pain during intercourse. It can actually cause pain vaginally during exercise and even with simply walking or ambulating. Um, you can have a healthy sex life after menopause. Um, and if you are having pain with intercourse, um, it's important that you try a few things. One is be open with your partner about what you're feeling and the changing, uh, the feelings that are, that your, how your body's changing. Um, using a water-soluble lubricant is a complete must to start with. And sometimes that alone is enough to help um, just moisten the vagina for intercourse. Um, but also talking um, to a gynecologist like myself about medical treatment options. Um, sometimes a lubrication is not enough and there are local treatments, um, actually even oral treatments, um, for this vaginal dryness. Hormone replacement that you take sometimes for hot flashes can also benefit you vaginally, where you don't experience the same degree of vaginal dryness. But there's also um, local estrogen use. And some women who don't have hot flashes or the need to take medication that affects their whole body, and sometimes they're trying to avoid any risk with that medication, they can take medication vaginally that can help with um, the changes that they're experiencing um, in their vagina. Bone changes. So in the first four to eight years after menopause, that decrease in estrogen that I've been referencing tends to accelerate bone loss. And this increases the risk for osteoporosis. Um, to prevent bone loss and to re reduce that risk of osteoporosis, you want to make sure that you're getting plenty of calcium. Milk, yogurt, cheese, those are the obvious forms of calcium, but those aren't for everybody. Um, a lot of patients have difficulty processing lactose at this age, um, and so we commonly recommend calcium supplementation. I'm a big fan of um, calcium citrate. It's the best absorbed calcium. I recommend commonly a brand called Caltrate Petites because they're not these humongous pills that allow patients to replete their calcium should they not be getting it in their diet. Dietary sources of calcium, in addition to milk, yogurt, cheese, include salmon, tuna, eggs, excuse me, that's vitamin D, those are, that's, and that's required for helping the absorption of calcium. Um, those are found in salmon, tuna, eggs, and, and obviously indirect sunlight. Um, I'm sure there's been a webinar already about vitamin D and indirect sunlight because you have to juggle the balance of sunscreen to decrease your risk of skin cancer also. The thought is that you're safest in morning hours um, for absorption of sunlight for vitamin D absorption um, so that you don't increase the odds of sunburn or sun damage. Um, so the other thing that helps protect against bone loss is weight-bearing exercise. 
And that includes um, brisk walking, hiking, stair climbing, running, weightlifting, things that are great exercise, but it does not include our swimming, even elliptical trainers. If you feel that you're gliding and you're not feeling the weight of your body on the ground, then you're not doing weight-bearing exercise. And the things that I've listed with regard walking, climbing, um, those are weight-bearing exercises. So that's important to make sure that, yes, I don't want to dissuade anyone from exercise, but weight-bearing exercise um, is not every form of exercise. So cardiovascular disease. The risk of cardiovascular disease increases during a um, woman's midlife, um, and it actually is the number one killer of women in the United States. It's really after the age of menopause that women's cardiovascular disease becomes more significant, closer approximating the cardiovascular disease of men. And as I said before, there have been studies in the last year that have come out suggesting that cardiovascular disease is associated with an increased risk of um, symptomatic hot flashes. So what do you do to prevent cardiovascular disease? It's so obvious. Please, don't smoke. And if you are smoking, it's not too late. Take the time to figure out how to stop. You can talk to a primary care about this. Um, there are helpful aids for smoking cessation. Also, obviously, eat a diet that is um, rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lean proteins, and, and avoid high, a low, encourage a, you know, yourself to in, do a low-fat diet, not a particularly fatty diet full of fast food. Exercising daily um, sounds like a great goal, and I tell patients to aim towards daily. It usually irons out to be about five times a week. Um, but Heart disease is twice as likely to strike inactive patients than patients or people, excuse me, who exercise regularly. And that's where I don't want to dissuade anyone from swimming or the um, or the glider machines. Aerobic exercise of all kinds, brisk walking, running, swimming, are definitely beneficial for protection for cardiovascular disease. So emotional changes. This is, again, a time where I make an analogy with women with perimenopause and menopause and puberty. Um, because as common as emotions change in puberty, so do they in this um, stage of life for women. Changing hormones affect women's emotions. And they lead to mood swings, depression, also poor concentration, and lapses in one's memory. So what do you do about it? Well, you talk with family, friends, counselors. Talk therapy is without risk, so it's a great recommendation. Um, again, exercise regularly. It will help. Um, try to control stress as much as you can. If you have the option of a less stressful job, please take it. It'll help you emotionally. Um, get plenty of rest, sleep, and all the suggestions I made to help with sleep, I recommend. If you're not able to sleep, it's very difficult to manage your emotions. And then, most importantly, consider medication. This is not a forever stage of life, and sometimes that, that up and down emotional feeling that you have, the swings and mood, um, I joke with women that if you're feeling like that you want to eat someone alive or chop someone's head off, you don't have to feel that way. Um, the combination of counseling with medication um, is very beneficial and can really help women get their life back for this difficult stage of life. So in your 60s and beyond, menopause affects bone density levels. So we talked a little bit about um, what to do to help protect bone. At this stage, we talk about DEXA scans or um, testing the density of bone. And at age 65, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends screening for women to make sure that your bone density is OK. We screen earlier with risk factors, strong family history, um, certain patient descriptions. Also, if you've had a history of a broken bone, those increase the odds that you have osteoporosis and need to be scanned with regard to bone density. Okay. And that's it. Okay, so we started about five minutes late, so we're going to go over a little bit so we can answer some questions for you. And let me see. I'm actually going to get us started um, with a quick question. Is it 
have any correlation with girls who have an early period that they go into menopause sooner, or is it kind of just, it just happens when it happens to everyone? I'm sorry, repeat the question again? If somebody has their period earlier in life, like a girl has it when she's, say, 10 or 11, would she go into menopause before? Not necessarily. Okay. Um, she does, I mean, the factual answer is that she has so many eggs, and so she will go through menopause when she no longer has a store of eggs in, that, in her ovaries. So the, the timing by which someone goes through puberty does not determine the timing for menopause. Okay. There are, however, familial trends where mothers and daughters commonly will have um, similarity with regard to their onset of menstruation, not always, um, and they also have similarities with regard to trends with menopause and the onset of that time of life. Okay. So a question I'm reading says, is there a test to determine menopause? Um, that's a great question. There are lab tests that let us know whether or not you're in menopause. Very specifically, we do a test called a follicle stimulating hormone test or an FSH test. And if it's above a certain level, it suggests that one's in menopause. Um, it is a tricky test because sometimes we will tell patients that their value is such that we think that they're not in menopause because it can vary so much at the time of perimenopause. So the truth is, the best time to do an FSH test is when you're trying to show somebody yes to a patient, yes you are in menopause, when it's been a matter of several months that they have not had a menstruation. Can you, and the next question I see is, can you have hot flashes if your blood pressure is above average? And yes, having hot flashes has really no relationship to blood pressure. You can have hot flashes with low blood pressure, you can have high um, hot flashes with high blood pressure. So how about taking melatonin um, to get a better night's sleep? Yes, melatonin is a suggestion that is a kind of an herbal suggestion that does help some patients. Not all, um, but it is beneficial to some patients. So I do tell patients that it's worth a try. So the next question I see is, I am 65 and I still have severe night sweats. Let me first tell you that I'm sorry. Um, I tell patients commonly that my mom, who has since passed away, she had hot flashes into her 70s. Um, this patient also says, I continue to menstruate um, until, I continue to menstruate until about age 58. Um, is this within the normal range? So I would say to a patient that is having menstruation um, through the age of 58 that she is the more extreme range with regard to stopping one's menstruation. Also, it seems not uncommon to me that one would still have hot flashes when it's only been seven years since they stopped having a period. The timing away from when someone stops their period, as they get further from that, they're less likely to have the frequency um, be high of having hot flashes. So can I have an IUD at age 40? Sorry, the next question. Can I have an IUD at age 40? Can having an IUD, excuse me, at age 40 increase perimenopausal symptoms? And the answer to that is no. An IUD, um, well, I shouldn't, let me make sure I'm prefacing that. An IUD placed at age 40 is not uncommon because sometimes women still need contraception, but also sometimes at age 40 women are starting to have heavier periods, and an IUD can sometimes be a great treatment option for those heavier periods. An IUD, however, does not affect ovulation. So it will not affect the experience of hot flashes. It will affect symptoms that involve bleeding. So the next question I see is, are there psychiatrists that understand menopause and how to prescribe antidepressants for that age? So the answer to that is, I don't know for sure. but. I don't know that you need to have a psychiatrist for that prescription, that I think that most OBGYNs that, that practice gynecology for women in the menopausal age range should be adept at prescribing or at least considering the prescription of an antidepressant. 
I guess I shouldn't speak for all, but I do, as I said, use um, antidepressants for that purpose. Can you repeat the dose and brand of calcium supplements and vitamin D supplements to prevent osteoporosis? Gladly. I like Caltrate Petites. The recommendation is calcium citrate. 1,200 milligrams is recommended daily. With vitamin D supplements to prevent um, osteoporosis, we recommend that you, sometimes a primary care will check a level of vitamin D that lets you know if your level is adequate, um, but we recommend at least 1,000 milliequivalents or there, it's a certain IV, it's an IU, but if you look at the bottle, any vitamin D, it'll just say vitamin D um, at the pharmacy, and you want to take a thousand a day if you're going to take a supplement. If you'd like to know if you need more or less, um, then I'd recommend that you have your OBGYN or your primary care doctor test your levels of vitamin D. Next question, if you have had a medical procedure, such as an ablation or a hysterectomy, um, can that make the symptoms of menopause less? Well, it can definitely make it confusing as to whether you're in menopause or not, because obviously an ablation or a hysterectomy should, if an ablation is successful, result in you not having um, a period. And so you can't use the presence or absence of your period to determine if you're in menopause. If you've had um, a hysterectomy or an ablation and you um, have profound hot flashes, you can have an FSH drawn that can also help you determine whether in fact your hot flashes are due to menopause. Next question, and I'm being told that I have five more minutes, so I'm going to have someone interrupt me at that mark and just keep going until I get there. Um, should my 14-year-old see a PD and an OBGYN doctor? Can the pediatrician perform the same services as an OBGYN doctor? Yes, I think so. Um, the pediatrician that you see should be talking to a 14-year-old about the Gardasil vaccine, about her menstruation. A lot of pediatricians, if there's a problem with a 14-year-old girl's period, um, at that time prefer that she see an OBGYN. So in term, the next question is, is there a maximum dosage of melatonin? And the answer is, I don't know. So I'd have to actually look that up. Um, so I apologize for not knowing that answer. Next question is, is it possible to conceive with one fallopian tube? Does the amount of eggs diminish with one fallopian tube. So yes, it is very possible to conceive um, and have a pregnancy happen with fallop one fallopian tube. Um, and there's no association with ovulation and the presence of having just one fallopian tube. That patient should just as successfully conceive a pregnancy. Um, it would be important to make sure that, as with anybody, once pregnant, that that pregnancy is documented or shown by ultrasound to be in the right spot, specifically in the uterus. Next question. I'm 41. I'm assuming that my heat rash came from walking outside, but I also wake up sweating sometimes and during the night. Am I, perimenop am I premenopausal? Um, do birth control pills curb hot flashes? So um, heat rash in Houston is very common with walking, especially with chafing, and I talk to patients about ways to protect their skin with Aquaphor and Glide all the time. Um, if you are waking up sweating at night, then it's very possible that you are having perimenopausal symptoms even at age 41. It's also possible, though, that this is some other hormonal problem. So I think it's important that if you're having this experience at 41 that you see a gynecologist to consider testing. One of the most important things to rule out, for example, is thyroid disease. Um, and birth control pills, yes, they are a form of estrogen replacement. And so, yes, they definitely curb hot flashes. However, there are some patients who on very low-dose birth control pills, even in their 30s and early 40s, sometimes feel an increase in hot flashes because their suppression, they're having ovulation suppressed so significantly by birth control pills. So for that, for this patient, I'd recommend that you consider a visit just to further um, figure out exactly what's going on with your body. 
okay, is there anything special for diabetics but beyond the normal guidelines for them? Um, I, that, that a little bit of a general question, so I'm going to defer that question to really a primary care doctor to be um, more efficient. Um, I think that, I don't know about, so I'm getting asked a question about a copy of this presentation. Yeah. Okay, so we actually record all of our presentations, and this will be posted online um, probably by next week, next Wednesday. We try to do it about a week out, and so you can always go back and revisit this presentation, and the question and answer portion will be included in it. Um, my last question is about water-based lubricants. Are there some that are better than others? Um, I recommend commonly um, Astroglide to my patients. There is a product line called Good that's also available at Target. Um, but there are actually a lot of water-based lubricants, and I recommend that you consider just trial and error also. Those are just the ones that I commonly recommend to patients. And I think that might be all our time. Thank you. So again, we apologize for getting started a bit late, but we made up for it with all the questions. Um, so that is actually going to conclude our webinar, and I want to say thank you to all of you for joining us this month, and also thank you to you, Dr. Sander, for all of the great information. We hope that you all will be able to take it and use it in your own lives. Um, and don't forget to join us next month for our webinar on July 14th titled Tummy Troubles, Don't Ignore Your Digestive System, featuring internal medicine physician Shane McGee. Uh, the gut is often referred to as a second brain, so if you want to tune in to see if your stomach or your heartburn or even your emotions are being controlled by your gut and your digestive tract, uh, this is going to be a great webinar to attend. And don't forget to follow us on social media and join in on the conversation. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll talk to you all next month. Thank you.